listen only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this morning about redefining the care team to meet population health objectives. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you to our webinar today, but before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Right now, you are all in listen-only mode, uh, which means that we won't be able to hear you, but of course, we do want to hear your questions. So if you have something that comes to mind, please do go over to the right side of your screen. There should be a chat uh, box down there. Please enter your question there. We will answer them as they come in if we can, and if not, we will save them for the end of the session and answer them then. Um, please do share any of your questions. Really looking forward to hearing what you all have to say today. So let's get started. Great. So welcome to Redefining the Care Team to Meet Population Health Objectives. My name is Brittany Hagedorn. I lead Simulate's healthcare team in North America. And I have the opportunity to introduce you to Phil Smelter this morning. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Phil a few months ago when this program was still in development. Uh, and I've really been looking forward to seeing how the results came together. And having seen it now, I'm really uh, very excited for you to have the opportunity to see it as well. A uh, little bit about Phil. He is the Population Health Program Administrator at the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, he has a lot of really interesting experience in managing at-risk populations, uh, looking at how to improve health, uh, and how to look at productivity. Uh, and this has really been a, a lot of work um, in innovation and technology and using those platforms to transform how healthcare is delivered. Today's uh, presentation is going to be about a program that he has launched at MUSC. And really what he's looking to do is change mindsets and culture and look at the structural pieces uh, that are required to implement a population health strategy effectively. Um, and looking specifically at diabetes, but of course these principles are applicable across the spectrum of, of issues. Um, what I really love about what Phil has done is that he's done it in a gaming environment uh, to introduce some, some interesting elements, some fun elements that really engage uh, clinicians. So with that, I will hand you over to Phil and uh, please do enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Brittany. I appreciate the, the kind introduction. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, Medical University campus. Uh, so the complexity of the buildings and the hodgepodge nature uh, is, I think, indicative of the environment. And I'll get into a little more detail on that uh, later. This is not the view out of my window either, by the way. Set expectations. Today, uh, I'd like to give some background, sort of uh, help you appreciate why we developed the simulation and, and the gaming environment. Uh, how that actually is set up and works, um, and then how participants uh, will go through the, the training. Uh, and we'll actually uh, let you make a decision, and we'll run the simulation and, and see how we do as a group. So uh, hopefully it will be uh, as entertaining or close to as entertaining as the uh, actual simulation is for our physician participants, our target audience. MUSC is a classic academic medical center, very complex. Uh, we have uh, four different hospitals on one campus, uh, and we have uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, patients, a lot of uh, traffic flow for patients. Uh, we have faculty, we have uh, students, uh, we have uh, medical students, residents, fellows, uh, as well as a primary care environment. The target audience are the primary care physicians who are employees uh, of, the, uh, of the system. So that's sort of the backdrop and uh, the um, traditional slide, so you know uh, our perspective, so to speak. This is my favorite slide, uh, not necessarily everybody else's. This is a logic model that we use to describe our strategy for population health uh, here in the organization. Uh, the simulation and the training really comes in the third swim lane down, so the lighter bar uh, labeled clinical care. Uh, this is what we're really talking about. How do we interface with the patient, uh, with the individual uh, in their situation, and how do we bring additional uh, players, clinicians, members of the healthcare team to bear uh, on the on the individuals? This is our what's referred to uh, as our constellation slide. 
So we want the patient in the middle, of course. The blue or the uh, purple, uh, depending on how it appears on your screen, those actors or players are currently present in the system. So you have, of course, your uh, physician that's there. And then the gray uh, labels or individuals, those uh, planets, if you will, that's who we want to add. So in population health, we want to bring those individuals to play that are not there today, the social workers, the health coaches, uh, the farm Ds, uh, care management nurses, uh, community-based individuals such as the public health clinics. Here it's the Department of Health and Environmental uh, Center, which is the DHEC. Uh, the discharge planning, that initial TCM is transitional care management. So although they are present today, they really don't interface with each other. They're kind of their own little, little silo. So this is what we want to train our audience or our participants. How do you go from just that blue section to this entire solar system, if you will? And what we want to show is, is that you know, we're, we're, we want to piggyback on what's already been done in previous uh, simulate uh, webinars. And uh, Brittany may be able to help uh, with that. Yes, thank you, Phil. So I think it's really interesting that uh, Phil wanted to include this. Um, when we think about some of the previous webinars that we've talked about, um, what he's referencing here is a webinar from a few months ago when we were talking with folks from both Canada and the UK about how they manage population health. And I think the key takeaway here is that we know population health management works. It's been shown uh, both in simulations as well as in real life um, how if we take a population approach, we can really reduce cost and improve quality and uh, improve the patient experience and really achieve that triple aim um, that we're all aiming for. And so I, I think the key takeaway here is just to keep that in mind that what Phil's talking about is not actually revolutionary. It is revolutionary in the sense that uh, we have not necessarily embraced this in the past in the U.S., but if we look to uh, both, the, both the West Coast, California has done some really good work uh, on this, as well as other countries, we can learn a lot from them um, about how to, to really take this forward. Um, we do know that these strategies are effective. The question is, how do we get it done? Great. Thanks, Brittany. So the objectives when we produced the, uh, the simulation, we want to train physicians. That was the challenge. How do you take physicians who have a limited amount of time but more importantly, they've been practicing medicine a certain manner for, you know, whether it's just one year or 50 years, they're used to a normal routine and, and they do business in a certain way. So we wanted to stimulate these physicians to consider these other care team members and get them involved in the care of the patient. One, because it's better. You have better care. Physicians are not trained to counsel a tobacco user on how to quit or how to get an obese patient to lose weight. But we have behaviorists, we have tobacco cessation counselors, they do that and they're very good at it and they cost less than a physician. So how do we get physicians to do that? This is, this is the solution and, and our objective. So we wanted to make it tangible, so we, we didn't want this to be theoretical, which is typically the way we train everybody on population health. You know, we give them the slide deck and we talk about um, the triple aim that, that Brittany uh, mentioned, and, and it, it, it comes across too many times very theoretical. So the simulation solution was perfect because it makes it real world. We could take real costs that were based on the literature, so now they're defensible. So we knew going in front of MDs and other clinicians that they would challenge the data, and they would want to know, where would you come up with this? Um, and they'll, everybody always thinks I make stuff up. So we had to make it literature-based and research supported. We also know, and, and from my experience, physicians are very competitive. They all want to be better than average. Uh, so as a result, they naturally will, will compete with each other, but they want a definitive outcome. So we needed the, the science-based approach that would give us this quantitative output. And the simulation uh, combined with gaming uh, seemed to be a perfect solution. <clears throat> So we developed this, this gaming concept using the simulation. We take a, a population of 10,000 individuals, uh, and we set up the training for a two-hour period. 
uh, that they would break up into teams of four or five. So uh, we've had eight to 24 was our target. I've, we've had as many as 50 individuals in a room that have gone through the participation. Uh, and we want to train the senior leaders first. That has not gone as much as we had planned on that. Uh, but what has happened is we've, we've been able to get word of mouth promotion. So people who go through love the simulation, love the gaming aspect. And we've been able to just sort of snowball that and get participation. So it, it's been very successful, very, very pleased with the output. Um, and we figured out, how do you do that? How do you train a physician to change their practice in two hours? The outcome is not to change practice, because they may not have the staff that's uh, in that solar system from the previous slide. Uh, they may not have a contract uh, here in the US that, where we're at risk. But conceptually, it, it helps them open up so they get it. So when we have those resources available, Hopefully, they will revert back to the training and this concept uh, and be more likely to refer individuals into these uh, other allied professionals. Uh, and, and so some of this I've already covered. Uh, it's a gaming. If anybody has, has gone through a gaming environment uh, as a team, you, know, you have time where you're given the scenario. Then you have your discussions. You have to make decisions. The decisions are input. You see the outputs. And then we go through four rounds. The four rounds are supposed to equivocate a year in time so that you have four months, four years. The reason we picked four years of time frame is it takes typically two to three years to break even. The health promotion data is, is pretty clear that if you took a fixed population, you won't start breaking even till year two, and you won't get a strong return on investment till year three, and you can't maintain that beyond four or five years. So it, this was not just a matter of convenience. There's data that supported this decision. Phil, I just want to jump in and mention something here. What I think is really unique um, about the way you've approached this is this competitive gaming environment. And I'll just uh, give a shout out um, to Flowrate, which is another program uh, which is designed to use this kind of gaming competitive environment uh, in, a, in a simulation tool to teach a particular concept, and that is around um, how hospital management can work, right? And, and that was actually developed to train physicians as well, because that's really the way that uh, seems to resonate well with them, is that kind of problem-solving, um, team-based, you know, uh, tackling of a challenge, um, and, and really trying to, you know, get to that perfect answer. Um, I think you really tapped the psychology of, of the clinicians that we're working with. So I just wanted to give that uh, shout out because I think it's um, something that we're starting to see more and more in uh, physician training and um, is really a, a, an industry trend um, that we need to start paying attention to. Great, thanks. It, that's been our experience, not having the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I, I do have a couple PowerPoints. Some of the slides that you see here are used. Uh, but most of the information now in this next section are in a handout. So sometimes they're sent that information the day before, um, and other times they're just given, they're handed that, uh, it's about a six-page document, and it has the instructions and the rules, uh, and many of these next slides will be in that, uh, that handout. Uh, and this gives them the background so they can then compete. Uh, but th this is sort of the training aspect. So here's how population expenditures are typically distributed. Um, you know, preventive care falls into that first largest bucket of other, and, and it's the miscellany. Uh, nothing here that isn't, uh, probably most of us haven't seen, nothing here surprising. Uh, we do want to emphasize that from our data and from the uh, research data that's been published, average cost for an individual who's been diagnosed with diabetes is $12,500 per member per year, the PMPY. So in this population of 10,000, we know that, that the pre-diabetes uh, prevalence is about 35%, that the type 2 diabetes prevalence is about 8%. And then the, we segmented the group into four categories based on their hemoglobin A1C level. And then we know some people don't have uh, an A1C on record, uh, whether they've taken it or not. The data is not available. Uh, and we also know that of that 800, 200 um, are not even diagnosed. 
Uh, so this is going to come through, and this is the data that drives the 10,000 individuals through the simulation. When we look at a population, this is how it's going to be distributed. Uh, this is based on, on our data and using the, the 4,200 uh, per year figure for average cost for everybody in the 10,000 which comes out to $350 per member per month for those of you who are used to seeing that type of PMPM. PM. We are using that 800 patients with diabetes, like I said, and of course it's 12.5 for the average cost across all diabetics. So two things that I think are, that we emphasize for the, um, the participants. One is that, that typically for physicians, they want to focus in on high cost. So here in a population of 10,000, normally if you get an average population, which there isn't any such thing, but 50 individuals who spend more than $100,000 a year would be, would be typical. And they, those 50 people account for 5.5 million. And if you then drew the line to these people who were above 50,000, 50 to 100 and then over 100, that's only 350 individuals. But look at them the money. You know, they account for a significant, typically that segment of the population would account for 70% of the cost. Uh, and then where you have the majority of people here, they're not spending very much. And you even have some individuals who not only spend less than a thousand, but actually nothing uh, in the system in a given year. So these principles are, are coming out that where's the money to be saved is in this group here. A lot of the individuals who are very high cost claimants, uh, some of those are cancer, uh, some of those are uh, complex acute admissions, and there isn't much money to be saved. It's the individuals in the middle to keep them from migrating to the left on the bottom here, if you will. That's, that's the money to be saved or the improvement in health. So that's very important for the participants to appreciate um, how they're going to um, going to save money, if you will, within the uh, 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 simulation. And all we need to do is get rid of the, there we go, normal pen. All right. So now we, we, we look at all these other issues that the patients have in their lives. So this is a, a typical population. With the total population in the far right and, and represented parenthetically, so although in a in a typical U.S. population, 30% of the individuals will be obese, for individuals with diabetes, 50% hypertension, they have twice the rate of hypertension, hyperlipidemia the same twice, tobacco use is about the same, which is shocking, but it's still the same. And notice how little and how few participate in coaching or at the bottom in case management. So the message to the participants is you have a sicker population with more risk and you want to, uh, to address that. And you want to address it through coaching. For the primary care physicians, we want them to help the patients become uh, more adherent. And patient navigators can address individuals who are not adherent and who haven't been to the office to reach out, call them, and get them to come in for care, since even members who have a diagnosis of diabetes and they know they have diabetes, some of those patients don't go to the doctor, even within a year, some very small, but some don't even go to a doctor in, in a span of two years. So that's how the different uh, players in that solar system of pro providers and practitioners will interplay, and, and that's why this slide was, was created. We'll go through an operational definition uh, that's not uh, commonly used, the attributable risk faction, fractions, excuse me. Uh, that's the key element here, uh, is, is this additional cost above that $4,200 a year that an average person is spending in the simulation. The numbers that we use for savings are above and beyond that average across the entire population. Uh, we found that even in physicians, they get mixed up on prevalence and incidence. So we review that. Um, and etiological fractions are uh, really what we, we've been discussing so far in many of the um, 
uh, services that are attributed to the disease on the previous slide. So I'm, I won't go through the slide, so uh, we can all start uh, keep breathing. Um, but I did want to show what we show the participants so that they understand that the simulation is based on data that has been published and reviewed. And we validated the data that we use in the simulation against what we have here in our health system. And it's all, it's rational. Uh, if you look at the diagnostic test uh, in the middle where we've got the 44% um, uh, who have a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7, so notice that those percentages are not the 200, 200, or 200. They're not the 2% or 20% in this case that I had used in the simulation. I, we've rounded some things, and we've made the, the math a little easier. Uh, one, just for simplicity. But generally speaking, it's, it's all right here. Um, and then in the bottom left, you can see those um, etiological fractions for cost. And in the brackets is the amount uh, of excess dollars that are um, added or used in the simulation. So the output is going to be savings, and it's based on a percent off of those brackets. Uh, they're in brackets because I adjusted it from the data was from 0708, and we wanted to put it in present dollars. And then the last bullet on the right-hand column is that cost influence. So we calculate everybody who makes it through the simulation. 7% reduction in cost is applied towards that uh, cost fraction that, we, that I've been talking about. And the references are cited in the lower right. And if you have questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, Brittany will uh, shock me and get me to stop talking, and we'll answer your questions. So you can save them to the end. But if you have something that comes up, uh, please uh, send us a message. Uh, and We'll try to address it uh, during the presentation. Phil, so can you just um, flip back there real quick? Can you tell us where you got those cost numbers from? Are those your local system, or are those uh, national numbers? Oh, thanks. So the 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 parentheses came from um, the references on the right, and then I just used an adjustment of I added thirty percent to those to get the bracketed or the the current dollars. When I looked at our health system data. I found that that it was approximate. The numbers were different, but they were generally the same. And then I just made sort of an editorial decision. I did not want to have to defend the data or the analytics team here. So I used published data that they could go read the article instead. That was a uh, mechanical, political decision that I made uh, just from my experience in having to defend the data that I present to physicians. I wanted sure. to be able for them to read a paper. So that's a good question because that, that does come up. Is, is where, and that's why this slide is so important for the participants. They want to know where the model, what was the model based on. Um, OK? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks. So and in the game, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so before uh, Phil gets into the details of the simulation, I just want to remind everybody, or let you know, rather, that uh, there's going to be a quiz at the end here. And we're actually going to run the, the simulation forward based on your recommendation. So do pay attention to the details of how the model is set up, because uh, we will be running it and, and testing your uh, assumptions about how the system works. Great. You, you gave away the, now they have to listen. And now they have to try to remember what we've already presented. So, uh, so you we'll see it. how you all do as a group. Uh, the simulation is based on the fact that we have this prevalence that we've talked about in the population. And then when we run an intervention, we have to recruit people to try to participate. They have to agree to participate. They have to complete the intervention. And then when they do, they're going to have to maintain that health before you have a change in utilization. And then that impacts the disease progression and regression. Um, and, and so we've got some certain decisions that are based uh, on how we're going to set the simulation up. And this goes into some of the details, which when the slides are available, if you want to go back and, and look at these, that's why we wanted to present this. Uh, on the sake of time uh, and to prevent uh, boredom, I won't go through all of these. Uh, and that most of the things that we talked about uh, will become more apparent as we go through. And you're going to then make decisions on how you make the analytics investments and how the staffing alignments uh, allocations are completed. 
So again, I, I talked about what are the outcomes. So we, we calculate savings. That's the true outcome here that we're going to present to the participants, and that's how we rate the teams, is who saves the most money. We also calculate total cost, and we know the number of participants, because as I had said previously, that's how we calculate the savings. But there's a key aspect to how that is, because individuals cost uh, less and more depending on their A1C status and depending on their, their other uh, risk factors. So uh, those are the outputs. This is a simplified uh, flow of how the, uh, the simulation uh, is designed. And, and you will actually see we're going to, when you make your decisions, then we're going to run simulate. And you'll be able to see exactly how your decisions impact the outputs. Uh, but again, we'd start off with 10,000 individuals. Uh, some are at risk. Uh, and some of them uh, have the diagnosis. So we put them into the four stratas of health. And then the majority of the people are not targeted because they don't have diabetes. and they don't. So we just focused on the individuals who have prediabetes and diabetes. So it's a simplified output for the gaming and training concept. This is not a simulation that projects cost. That's a future, that's a future product. We want to do that using actuarial type of uh, assumptions, uh, which is another you know product altogether, uh, but that's not what we're doing. We're not predicting cost. We're trying to get people to understand uh, how population health can be managed. We know from the literature that we typically have a, a reduction in the number of participants, um, and this three erosions of 50%, cleverly illustrated as the cascade of, of waterfall, uh, will occur. So we put one in right after they were stratified. They are communicated and, and targeted through predictive analytics and, and other types of patient registries that would occur. Um, after that, there's another, or during that, and after that, there's an erosion. Then the patients go to coaching and case management. Then after that, they're going to experience the patient navigator. We put in the third and final erosion, and then they're treated by a physician at the end. This is not necessarily the way that patients flow through the healthcare system. They may encounter a patient navigator first, and then communications, maybe analytics, maybe a doctor, then coaching. But this is how the simulation is set up. And some of this is simplified, and we can't mimic all the various uh, routes that patients may go through. So this is the way that it, it actually functions. And this is the decision seat sheet that so you have the teams of you know four or five physicians, and then they get together. They've been given that information that I quickly went through on the slide, and now they have to make their decision. Uh, they come up with the team name, some clever, some not so clever. Uh, what round they're in, because this is going to be input by the operator into simulate and to actually run the simulation. They make a decision on the infrastructure, which you'll do. Uh, we've simplified this today for the group uh, when we poll you. But they have a half a million dollars, and they have to allocate that between analytics and communication. Uh, communication being the patient communications. It could be through a patient portal. It could be through a postcard or a letter. Or it could just be somebody calling them on the phone. That's where that budget is. And then the real meat of the training and the simulation is how do they allocate their resources. So they have a million dollars. And that is approximately the staffing model that we use here for a group of 10,000 individuals. We forecast that we need approximately 10,000, excuse me, a million dollars for the staffing. When we use that on low income, or we use that on Medicare, or we use it on a commercial employed population, the staffing numbers change, but the budget amount is about the same. Uh, so it, it's this is it is real world. The uh, salary amounts I've simplified uh, because I didn't want to get into uh, the arguments with individuals. As an example, the physicians, and I just noticed a typo. It always happens. Notice it in the presentation. But the uh, FTEs for physicians and the extenders are is 175,000 a year, and we lump those together because I didn't want to get into the discussion of them using nurse practitioners cost less than that and having a different line item for nurse practitioners. And we also added, as an example, farm, doctors of pharmacy, PharmDs, into the registered nurse certified case manager category. Um, so this is their decisions. 
they have to they get to burn up to a million dollars, and they then allocate people accordingly. So uh, on this slide, you can see that if you wanted to buy nothing but MDs, NPs, and PAs, you could buy five of them and still stay under your budget. Uh, if you wanted to buy all patient navigators, you could buy 16 of those. What people do and what you'll do today is you're going to uh, make decisions based on uh, some variant of that with a, with a number of each of those categories. Um, and then the uh, upper right is a useful piece of information that may help you in your decisions, and that's how many individuals those types of labor roles uh, see or can handle in a year. So the case managers may only handle 50 to 75 individuals at one time. They go through those in a number of months. Their capacity is about 350. Health educators uh, and patient navigators, as you can see. Uh, so this is the data that helps you make a decision. Uh, and this is a review of that data and communication. Uh, it's just the way the mechanics worked. I wanted to simplify this to make our model functional. We couldn't make it continuous data. Uh, we needed to have options. Uh, so this is one of the things we learned in the development is we had to simplify the decisions that the individuals will make. And this is one way we did that. So in essence, there's only four variables here. Um, what they pick for one for data, they get the balance of it in communication. And that was just a practical approach to how to make the simulation not be too complex. And this is the uh, actual uh, screenshot, and you'll see that in a second. So as you can see, this is replicates what we had on that previous slide. Uh, but this is actually what the screen looks like. Um, but we no need to go through that in too much detail, because you'll actually see that. And if you have questions, we can answer those. The right side is the legend, because what I found is sort of a classic case. I know what a health coach is. I know what a patient navigator is. The audience did not. So we had to put up the definition of those individuals. Um, for us that are involved in population health, we get that, even though you may call them patient advocates, they're not navigators. The terms may differ a little bit, but you have a good idea of what a case manager does. We found that uh, the physicians, uh, in some cases, didn't have a clue what some of those were. Um, and especially when we were working with students, uh, they, they were not familiar with those terms. So a practical thing, we had to put that up there on the, on the board. I think, Phil, that's a really interesting point, the fact that you're working with docs who don't know what these words mean, right? Which kind of is a, a good example of where we're at culturally, that we don't even know, not only have we not necessarily embraced certain aspects of it, but we don't even know what our options are or what we should be asking for, right? Um, because we don't realize necessarily that, that those roles even exist, right? I think that's a really interesting cultural commentary. And there's. We'll see what decisions the group makes, but I'll talk about uh, people get the adjustments of the uh, staffing. They don't make terribly egregious mistakes. They do better than I thought they would. I thought the physicians would typically over-allocate physicians. They don't do that as bad as I thought they would. Uh, they make pretty good decisions. They do make other mistakes, and I won't tip my hand too much, but we'll talk about that, which I think is a key concept in population health, um, and we'll see how the group does. Uh, but um, but people are making a consistent pattern, which hopefully the training uh, helps uh, reduce or eliminate uh, in the future. And so this is just to make it a little bit easier. You'll see this in the actual simulate, uh, the way that, that actually Stephen uh, Fago uh, helped. Uh, he didn't help. He really did the majority of the engineering behind the scenes to make the simulation work. Uh, but but he set up the elegant, uh, neat graphics. Uh, and then he put these buttons up there for me um, and for people to see rather than have to go through all the clicks on simulate to get those up. So that's why we produced this spreadsheet that's actually on the visible page for individuals. And, and so that's that's how you actually see the um, uh, outputs uh, on the simulate, which, which you'll see. So now we're going to have to make decisions. Okay, so now we're going to go through the polling. And can we pull up the poll? Great. So this is where we need your help. Uh, so if you all can go in and actually choose which one you think we should be allocating more money, money to for this, uh, this run, um, you can either choose IT and analytics, or you can choose communications. 
Um, you heard Phil say earlier he's got a half million dollars uh, set up for um, to go into either one or the other of these. Um, in his model, there's more options, but for today, just uh, please pick one, and we will see uh, what you think we should be spending on in order to improve our population health. So we're going to give you just a few more seconds here to vote, and then we will pull up the answer. Can we see what people think we should be spending on? Okay. Uh, pretty even split there, actually. Uh, does that surprise you, Phil? It doesn't surprise me based on what other people have said. So uh, half the people are going to be right, half the people are going to be wrong. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, you know, so when people uh, are in small groups, Phil, do they tend to pick one or the other? Uh, or in your experience, do people tend to pick the, the split and kind of cover their bases just in case? They have a tendency to split. So if we gave you a C that said, you know, IT analytics, 50% of that and 50% communications are sort of that 125, 375 since there's a half a million dollars, that's where sure. most people come out in the first round. Interesting. All right, we'll see how that goes. So our second question then is how do we want see, to hire staff? Can everybody see that, Brittany, or do I need to redo this slide a little bit to bring it up? Uh, I, it's okay. We actually just pulled up the uh, quick poll. Okay. So people should be able to see the, the actual poll options here. Got it. Okay. Okay, so there's three options. Um, one is four coaches, four clinical support, three navigators, and one MD. And you can see the other two there. So the question really, you know, is how many MDs do you think you need? And then also what is the mix, the balance between the coaches, the clinical support, and the navigators? Um, so go ahead and take your pick. Which one do you think is going to be the optimal allocation? Um, Phil, can you tell us a little bit about the penalty as well while people are voting and how that works in future yes, rounds? Because, because there are four rounds, after the first round, if somebody wants to make an adjustment, and, and so we give, I give them some feedback after their first round and give them some hints, but I don't tell them the total solution. Then they can make changes in their staffing, but they're penalized. So for each person that they want to move one FTE from one category to the other, they're penalized to $100,000. To try to mimic, you, know, you can't just move people around like they're on a chessboard or a checkers. Uh, in the real world, you have to go through training and hiring, and there's the delay in time. Um, also, we didn't want somebody who made good decisions in the first round allow the other teams to catch up easily and just sort of copy what they did in the second round. So that's why the $100,000 penalty is sort of slow down the people who may have made uh, less than optimum or most efficient decisions in the first round. So they get a $100,000 penalty for each FTE that they move. Sure, and that, that's reflective of the real world as well, right? I can learn from you, but now I have to play catch-up. Correct. Okay, so what did people say? Wow, that is a fantastic set of results. Almost everybody selected the uh, option A, four coaches, four clinical support, three navigators, and one MD. And a couple of lonely people decided that, nope, the second MD was important and uh, compromised in the clinical support. Interesting. So we have uh, definitely a, a majority there with uh, option A. Any uh, comments on that, Phil, before we actually run the model? So you actually did pick the best option. So for the second question, that is the, uh, the optimum flow. And, uh, and we'll see that in the, uh, in the simulation. So let's go bring up simulate, and we'll input that in. So we go into the settings. We're going to allocate resources. And you said that you wanted to, it was sort of split. Uh, so we'll do, the, we'll do the split. We'll do the 30, we'll do it this way. I and think we'll do 375. Anal Go ahead. Analytics, Analytics was, was the stronger, yeah. Uh, okay. So we'll do it that way for health coaches, for uh, case managers, RNs, three of those and one of those. Okay. okay. So, Another thing that I'll, I'll show for everybody, so that's the maximum. So you can see how you made good decisions here because you, you're maxing it out. If, if you would have, so for those of you who picked two MDs, you can't input two MDs. What you did is you burned up some salary dollars on those MDs, 
which means you wouldn't able you couldn't have picked the four four three. You would have you're going to have less, so then it's less than optimum. Let's say you had two co two case managers. That's not the most optimum uh, ratio to have. So that's how they're input. Um, we'll show you the results. You can see the results down here um, that they're all zeroed out. And those are the here are the cost that we had um, we had talked about. So you see those appear again, uh, and that will be important um, when we. Uh, when we actually run. So we reset it already. So now I'm going to speed this up just a little bit in the spirit of time. But the participants love seeing the simulation run. They just think that's the coolest thing. It's the most exciting part of the two hours are the four times that the simulation runs. And what I actually do, because we have different teams, we only run the simulation like this one time for everybody to see. Then I turn the presentation device off. And then I'll run the other ones, but they just and then they get to take a break before we have the uh, the next uh, the next round start. So I'll go ahead and review um, what uh, what we had because it's an average distribution for all of the distributions here. It as in the real world, you know, you're not always going to have exactly ten thousand people. Uh, things change. Uh, 5,700 people was the way the model was set up. We get a little bit of variance off of that. Uh, we basically have 4,300 individuals that go through from this point, and then they get segregated into these five strata. We have half of them drop out, and then they uh, these are people that are left in the queue based on the allocation. They didn't make it through. We have our dropouts. Then the treatment care plan, that's where the case managers interact with the patients and to me and then they go to life's coaching so those are the two areas that they go to initially uh, and then after that they go to uh, patient navigation and then finally to patient treatment and then after navigation we also have the dropout so you can see that you have less than 500 individuals that make it through we started off with 10,000 we ended up with 4,372 here in this run that were available to go through, and we only got 500 people that cleared it. That's the real world. For those of you who have run disease management interventions or health promotion interventions, uh, hopefully you will support uh, this data that you don't get that many people that actually complete the program, made it all the way through, and saved money. Now, all the people make it through, and those that do, so you can see that the 22 people who are in the highest category or the hemoglobin A1C that is above nine, that's the 17,580 individuals of people, uh, dollars, and we had 22 people, and here's the savings that they produced. So as you would expect, those people cost a lot, and they save the most money. The other category that saves a lot, which is this. Now this is a really key part to health promotion. I have a bias because my background is predominantly health promotion. But you have you know, more than a quarter of a million dollars, but these were only $576 each. But we, it's because we had 341 patients. Because in this pre-diabetes category up here, there are 3,500 individuals, and then 200 in the other four categories. So that's why the lifestyle coaching is so important, and that's why you needed four individuals to do the coaching because you have so many people. And you need uh, four care managers because they're interfacing in such a complex case that they can only handle 50 people at a time. So that's why the 200 is the maximum that could go through the treatment care plan. And then 800 are the number that, that are the max that will go through the lifestyle coaching. That's why four and four is the, the, the textbook solution to those. Uh, I know that gets complex going back and forth, um, and uh, I apologize for that, uh, but in the spirit of time, it's really the only way we can do that. Hopefully, if you have questions and I've confused the group, uh, you, can, uh, you can ask those. And then for the subsequent rounds, uh, what we'll do is we'll go back through and so you, you all pick the optimum. Let's say that um, 
we go with 500 in analytics and here and we'll just go really low we'll just you know this isn't practical uh, because you would have left resources on the table but let's say you over allocated doctors then we'll run this and we'll see what happens we're not going to do the little entertaining thing we're just going to run it and here you can see that uh, how how the people dropped not substantially so even when you go to a really bad scenario the numbers don't change dramatically but they are lower and then let's uh, go back to the presentation and I will uh, so this is the output that uh, individuals will see and this is the maximum savings and this is the uh, minimum if they made the worst decisions all the way through bigger for everybody and then we show this we, we convert it to an Excel spreadsheet and that also helps us make decisions on what our inputs will be for the next round because the, the, the people that make it through in round one how they're allocated that's what gets forwarded into round two it starts getting complex without seeing it uh, but just that's how the rounds work and so we do that off uh, off sheet so to speak and produce an Excel spreadsheet so that they can see how they did on each round um, or excuse me in each category those are the four categories the four bars you see and they can compare themselves to each team and then one of the things that the groups asked for is what's the best and the worst we could do so then we show those savings and the team oops and the team work uh, down in the bottom and that gives them sort of a, an expectations how they're comparing uh, against the best uh, and if they really made some bad decisions are they the absolute worst or do they do better than that and most people are in the middle um, so simplicity be careful not to over engineer the decision leads to insight so as an example you kind of split the difference there on the analytics and the communications the school book solution for first round is you put all half a million dollars into analytics the rationale being if you don't have predictive modeling and you don't have registries and you don't have uh, order sets available for the clinical team then who are you going to communicate with you don't know who to communicate with the patient navigators will do some of that but for the more sophisticated communication infrastructure first build your IT infrastructure then later build the communications infrastructure and in the fourth round then it the best solution is all of your money in communications and none of it in IT now the real world doesn't operate like that you can't just take all your money away from IT but for your annual investment uh, you can spend more money in the communication uh, so it's that discussion and learning that really that's where the training actually takes place and the learning and the insights are developed in those discussions uh, between the teams and then afterwards and then they see it and they get it Whereas I, I'm of the belief that if we just put a PowerPoint up there and said, put all your resources in IT analytics, they won't remember it. Um, and that's why we've had such uh, great feedback from everybody who's gone through the, uh, the simulation. The other is be careful when you design this type of simulation or gaming. You know, and I talked about how we had to put up the definitions. What you think a patient navigator is not what you're audience may think and when you talk about prevalence or incidents be careful about your audience not being at the same level of knowledge or just using the same uh, verbiage uh, that you you have or the familiarity with terms so we tested and piloted this we went through four iterations before we went live with it and I changed almost 25 percent of the content or our approach in those early iterations um, we learn a little bit now at each version we'll learn something but it's kind of on the fringes uh, but but you need to test it several times before you should feel confident that you can go live with this uh, you have unintended uh, consequences that occur in the real world when we when we tried this uh, with that I'm out of slides everybody can uh, take another breath uh, and love to open it up for uh, questions or comments well, thank you so much, Phil. This was great. Um, 
I, I really like what you said just now about how the power of the the discussion as opposed to the the game itself, right? And that the power is in the well, why did that happen and how did it happen and what is going on here? Um, and we find that to be true across kind of any kind of simulation project. It's not necessarily just about the simulation itself giving an optimal answer. It's about the discussion and the learning that goes into it. So um, it's great to see that, that you've had a similar experience. Um, OK, so with that said, um, I do have a question here for you. Um, would improved risk stratification and identification of a population in the early stages help identify the undiagnosed? Um, would that make a difference? What are your thoughts about how that plays out in, in the simulation and also in real life? So first, uh, in real life, what I've seen continuously in the data is that uh, we know that, and this has been substantiated in the, uh, in the literature, there are a certain number of individuals with diabetes that are not diagnosed. Now, if you go to the medications, you can improve that if you have an EMR or you have pharmacy data. But even then, uh, it's shown that you cannot, you do not capture 100% of the individuals. So you, if you get more sophisticated with your data analysis, you can uh, increase your accuracy in identifying the diabetics. Uh, you, of course, do get a, to a point where it's the law of diminishing returns. Uh, so, you know, once you get, say, to 90 percent, you know, how much money do you want to spend or energies to try to get to 95 percent uh, of the individuals who have diabetes? Um, and it's, some of it's because we're using a claim system for a lot of our data, but even in the EMR, uh, it's not as inaccurate, so to speak. Uh, it's improved accuracy, but still, uh, it may not be 100% accurate, especially it depends on how you extract the data. So sure. with that, we didn't, um, so that your question kind of encapsulates the allocation of resources into IT and analytics. Right. So that's where you, we wanted people to think about, and that's where, so that type of a question after round would then be in the discussion of don't, don't try to over-engineer a glass of water here. Just identify a, a large part of your population and deal with what you have. Don't try to get to 100%. You're living in the real world. Just take what you have and improve it over time. I, hopefully that answers your question about should you build the risk stratification better into the simulation. That was intended to be just through the analytics, not uh, with any more detail. Sure, sure. Okay, another question for you. Um, it sounds like your uh, staff are not the only uh, people who are kind of confused about some of these different roles. Can you help uh, clarify what is the difference between a coach and the clinicians, and why not pool those resources as opposed to having them split across uh, the two different roles? Can you help us understand I what the difference is? Yeah, I love that question because leaders here, my door is closed so, I can, so we can talk amongst ourselves. Uh, but leaders here are always, oh, well, we have our uh, registered dietitians working in the um, endocrinology clinic. Why don't we just have them come work? You know, we don't have to hire health coaches to talk to diabetics we just, or CD, hire CDEs. We'll just use them. Well, those, they're doing something already. They're doing something today. They're not just sitting there. So if we take those people out of those roles and put them over here, then we're going to, we're now not interfacing with our patients in some manner. So we're going to create a gap. So these, this team is, they're new hires. They're an adjunct. Now, you can reallocate it depending on how evolved the system is. So I, in some community hospitals, they may have you know, community educators that could be reallocated or already kind of doing that job. And, and you wouldn't be uh, totally misappropriating them. Uh, you'd be just kind of directing them in, in a little bit of a different direction. In some uh, cases where those resources are there, you may be able to do that. Uh, but but that's why we didn't just say reallocate resources. And, and for our experience here, like we have a our family practice clinics, they don't have any case managers. Internal medicine has case managers. Internal medicine has a patient navigator that he likes walks on water, the guy is like a god in getting a hold of, of patients and getting them to come in and finding patients 
that nobody else can find. He is incredibly talented, but they don't have that type of person in the other clinic. And the clinics, one clinic uses an LPN to board patients, another clinic uh, uses a medical assistant. So we have different staffing models, and, and they basically just don't have staff anywhere close to do that. But from the question, I, I do agree that in some systems, you may have some staff that could be reallocated. But for the simulation, we didn't let them do that. The other part, which really wasn't the question, but has come up, and we had to clarify it. It was one of our learnings when we piloted, is that the physicians that are present in a clinic taking care of patients, they're still there. So this MD that or MDs that you want to hire as part of the simulation, they're just going to be there for taking care of the diabetic patients who are coming through. That helped understand pe people to understand why we needed these people, which kind of gets to the the gist of the question: Why don't you just reallocate people? You already have physicians mm -hmm. uh, interfacing with patients and treating them. You would want to hire another one because you're going to have more patients coming in, and you want to take care of the diabetes. Sure. Okay, one last question for you, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, could you tell me a little bit about how you get the physicians actually to participate in this program? Is this something that came down from on high, like thou shalt go to Phil's two-hour session, or how does that how's that playing out? Yeah, I tried that that uh, uh, Phil that down from high. It didn't work. I got no support from up high. Uh, it was too costly, mandated training. Uh, you know, that's like getting an audience with the supreme leader. Uh, not happen. They they wouldn't even entertain the thought. So that's why I thought of a gaming approach that would be entertaining and fun, and everybody likes fun. And then they would do through word of mouth. That so far is working. So we've been able to get the expansion of the training sessions based on uh, just really positive experiences. The other sort of strategy that I've employed is anybody who wants it. They get it. So the masters in public health students, we did it for them. Uh, we did it for a summer session, interdisciplinary studies. They got it. Uh, family practice first started off with just their fellows and uh, and residents, and then that went good enough. We had a good enough experience. I was able to parlay that. So now we're going to go uh, deal with the residents in another location, and now we're scheduled to teach the faculty and the practicing physicians in the clinic after that. So it's it's been snowballing. That's where the gaming really has fit, is it's it's a fun experience. It's not just Phil gave a really good PowerPoint. Um, nobody would line up at the door for that, for sure. Sure, absolutely. Um, so what are next steps? Where are you going from here? So we'll continue to uh, do this. We, we have thought of potentially having some other scenarios, one with multi-morbid conditions, uh, a cluster, um, and then uh, also maybe trying to develop one that's more financially modeled, uh, that's that's more actuarial based uh, for that. So uh, those are the next steps, but that'll probably be next year. Uh, we'll have our hands full uh, just getting this current uh, version, if you will, uh, into the streets and getting everybody spun up. Great. And if people are interested, um, can they reach out or can we uh, make some introductions for you? Absolutely. Yeah, I would love to help people with this. We learned a lot in going through this. There's a lot of uh, scars that I can show you as to things not to do. Uh, so I'd love to share that with you so uh, you can learn and develop some insights based on what we've done. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much again, Phil. This has been really fantastic. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, being here with us today. And uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you again soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody.